to uh, Painting on Glass with Emma Haji Antich. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and let her uh, tell you all a little bit about herself. Hi everyone. Um, so I wanna talk about glass painting and where I learned about it. it um, it's something that I picked up while I was living in Alsace, France which is, um, it's a small city on the border of France and Germany. And there's a lot of cultural exchange that happens there. And uh, under glass painting or reverse glass painting is a uh, folk art. It, um, it's not considered a fine art. It's something that um, they use to celebrate their various different uh, holidays and uh, traditions. You'll frequently see reverse glass painting employed to um, paint the different seasons. So there'll be a woman personified as uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, another really common thing that is used um, as a subject matter for reverse glass painting are the saints. And uh, be in this particular section of France, um, it's unique because Catholicism is, is mostly the, the sect of Christianity that was traditionally, um, uh, celebrated in France, but in this section, it's, uh, it's Protestantism and various forms of Protestantism. And so it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting mixture between Catholicism and Protestantism and also um, any lingering holidays that they have um, from Gaelic pagan times. So they really use it to be proud of themselves and their specific, very hyper local history. Um, and it's and it's a, and it's an interesting place in France because it um, it isn't very French and it isn't very German. It's a very strange hybrid place with ruins going back to the Druids. Um, and saints going back to like 200. So it's got a lot of history and this uh, uh, reverse glass painting uh, goes along with that history and celebrates the types of, um, so celebrates their heritage in that way. Um, so this is a, an example of a reverse glass painting. You have the painting under the glass. Um, it is, on the reverse side of the glass. And so this isn't the painting at all. In fact, the painting is behind here. Some people compare it a lot to, to printmaking in the way that um, in the way that the layers build up. Um, but it's more of a hybrid between painting and um, painting, but in the reverse. So that's why it's called reverse glass painting. Um, I think it's a really interesting surface to work with. I'm personally really interested in it because I like to, um, my specific interest in, um, in making art is portraying political and spiritual and religious beliefs, uh, or, or myths and not necessarily current ones or modern ones, but also ancient ones. And I think that glass is a really interesting um, medium for portraying belief or myth um, or culture because it's fragile, it's breakable. And so is belief, so is mythology, so is, uh, so is culture. And France and Germany being right on the border of each other, what could be a better example for political culture being fragile? Um, I think that this is also a fun medium for kids. Um, here's an example of something that you can do with painter, painter Suver, um, or a uh, reverse glass painting. It's just a pen holder, but I mean, it's reverse glass painting and it's fun for kids. Um, here is another way that kids can engage in it. This is just something that my son made. And again, and you just finish it off, you seal the back with spray paint so that it's pretty kid friendly. I make uh, small paintings like the one that I showed you, but I also make larger paintings.
These are just some examples of the large. I think that this is a really interesting uh, technique to use, especially if you're uh, an artist and you're used to working in one particular way, if you've gotten used to a certain pattern of thinking, right? Because if you are constantly doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, you can hit a wall, uh, you, can, um, you can hit a block, right? This is a nice way, I think reverse glass painting is a nice way to, um, to mix it up, to get out of your routine, to break up routine thinking. Um, so I'm going to give you a material list because this is, I do um, uh, a more traditional form of painting as well on, on board and on canvas. Um, and this material list is quite different from a uh, material list that you would use for painting with acrylic on canvas or on panel. So first of all, you're going to want glass, obviously. Um, glass can really easily be procured from the thrift store. That's where I get all of my glass. I get it from the thrift store or Austin Creative Reuse. Um, this is going to be a really good friend to you, Windex. Um, it's going to get off streaks from your glass and it's going to get off any grease like fingerprints, especially if you're making a painting like this, where there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of free blank space where the glass really shows through. Um, you're not going to want fingerprints on that. You're going to work really hard on it. And in the end, if there's fingerprints, you're going to be really upset about it. Same for something like this. All right. Um, you also want some small containers for when you're working. I like to just use like tiny little bottle caps and you just spray some Windex in there. And then along the way, if you find a fingerprint that's particularly offensive to you. You just dip your Q-tip in and you rub it right off. I also like to, I work really detailed. So I like to have a little bit of water in a cap as well so that when I am painting, my water is really close to my brush. All right. Also, I like to keep my brushes plentiful and keep my brushes clean when I'm doing this because we're going to be using a lot of colors. One of the ways I like to keep my brushes clean fast because we're working with fast drying acrylics is I have a um, su sushi tray, like a takeout sushi tray. Uh, and I don't know what you would use other than this as a replacement. I'm sure there's something, but this is what I use. It has these nice notches down here. And when you're cleaning a brush, it just washes the paint right out of the bristles. It's one of my favorite tools. You just pour a little bit of water there in the bottom and give yourself a nice surface for cleaning your brushes. And then you're gonna want paper towels because you're going to be cleaning up fingerprints and you're gonna be cleaning up Windex and you're gonna be cleaning off your palette knife. You need a palette knife. Uh, you're gonna be cleaning off your paintbrushes. You are gonna need lots of paper towels for this. And then you want your acrylic paints. I like for reverse glass painting to use paints that are very opaque. I like paints that are relatively fast drying so that's going to mean I don't like paints that are very loose. I don't like paints that are very um, runny. I want a fairly thick paint. I don't want an impasto. I just want uh, thorough coverage. So I like to use um, Van Gogh. This is a not a, a fancy kind of acrylic paint. It's, it's pretty cheap, but it's, um, its pigment is just very um, thick, very opaque, very saturated. Um, for the detail or the line work. So as you can see, we've got the lines that we're building up with the black, but we've also got this color that we're filling in that we're saturating into the background. Um, these colors are what I, I, I use the Van Gogh. Okay. So this is, this pink is just a, a little bit, uh, of white mixed with this Van Gogh paint, but these lines, I like to use a completely different paint brand for the lines. I use Golden. 
and I mix the golden with a little bit of acrylic medium. Uh, something that is a pretty uh, typical uh, misconception about acrylic paints is that if you want to loosen your acrylic paint up or if you want to thin it out, you use water. And that's, especially with this, not a great idea because you want your acrylics to stick to the glass. And if you're thinning it out with water, it's going to um, not create a very strong bind to the glass. And you really want your acrylics to bind to the glass. Otherwise you're gonna have problems uh, with the paint sticking to it. And this is a process where we use lots and lots of layers. And so if you build one layer, uh, like all these fine brush strips right here, if you build this layer up and then you go in with watered down acrylic, it's going to just lift up all of those lines that you spent an hour worth of time making. You really don't want that. So when you do go in, uh, if your paint is too thick for you to use, then use a medium. Okay, painting palette. I mix all of my paints before I start to paint um, because frequently you're gonna be working wet on wet. Uh, especially when you're blending, you're gonna be working wet on wet. So this is a painting palette. I guess it looks like paper on the camera, but it's got a waxy coat so that it's, um, it's, it's waterproof and you just mix your paints directly onto the palette. And then you can cut that up. Like I said, you wanna mix your paints that you're going to be blending beforehand. So you can cut it up and put it inside a piece of Tupperware like this so that your paints stay dry. They are in the waiting for you so that when you're ready to paint, they're already pre-mixed. If you do this with a little bit of um, uh, tissue paper or um, paper towel, then it'll stay wet. You close it up, you put it in the refrigerator and uh, it'll, stay, it'll stay moist for probably a week. So the kind of work that I do with reverse glass painting is very detailed. Um, even when I work on medium size uh, to larger pieces like this, there's a lot of detail work. Uh, this is the only plane where there is not a lot of detail, but as you can see, everything gets little uh, dots, little uh, treatments of uh, paint. So you, I do use a lot of small round brushes, pointed tip brushes. Um, and I like to have a lot of them when I'm working with this, because like I said, you switch color a lot. All right, so to begin with, to create those really fine lines, you wanna use a liner brush. This is a really fine tipped brush, but not only is it fine tipped, it's long. And so it creates, it holds a lot of paint and it creates a nice long consistent line. Whereas if you use just um, a regular fine tip brush, let's say this one has a nice point, has a nice tip, it's fine tipped. If you use it on something like this to create those lines, you're gonna have to dip, line, dip, line, dip, line. You're gonna exhaust yourself by like going back and forth, back and forth between the piece of glass and your paint. So this is a really nice, I mean, I think it's an indispensable um, brush for this kind of, um, for this kind of work. Then I do like to have um, round brushes. I think these are a size two right here, or no, they're size zero. Um, and they are good for adding in those little details. Like here you can see, dashes and lines and dots. A lot of those are done with these zero round brushes. For blending, I like to use a size two and a size six, depending on 
the area that we're going to cover. Then finally, there's the background. Okay. So once you've got all your details in place, you want to go ahead and fill in the background. For some of your backgrounds, it's not going to be big. This is not a large background, in which case you could just use um, a larger round brush like this. Um, but if you're working on something this big, you want a significant sized brush. And so I'll use a brush like this. It's called an angled shader. And you go in and you really layer up the paint. So you want something larger. That's brushes. You're gonna want an X-Acto knife for erasing. Um, I'll show you exactly what that looks like when we're in the middle of it. But that's one method of erasing. It's literally just scratching up the paint. Remember how you used uh, like blackboards or I don't remember what they're called, but paint, you paint black and then you scratch up the surface. We'll do something like that with the X-Acto knife. Um, and then when you're done with your, your painting and you want to seal it, you want to seal the background, um, we're going to turn it around and we're going to spray paint it. Now to prevent the spray paint from getting on the side of your painting that you want to present, um, you're going to want to tape down the front of it. So I like to use frog tape for that. That's about the extent of the list, the palette knife. <laughs> then I'll go ahead and do the overview. Um, first things first, um, this is, uh, this process can, it, although it's very, I think, uh, accessible and user-friendly, um, it takes uh, several steps and, um, and, and many layers, and it takes a lot of time in between to let those layers dry. You could use a hairdryer. My personal experience is that if you use a hairdryer to dry your paints to try and speed up the process, um, it, it doesn't, it do, it's not very effective. And you end up uh, kicking yourself later because you took the easy route or the faster route. This, this does take some time. So in between every layer, I like to let it dry for 24 hours. So because we don't have, <laughs> Uh, four days. Um, I've already gone ahead and prepared the steps for you. Um, the first thing that's really important is that you, if you're getting your your um, your glass from the thrift store, or even if you're getting it from an arts and craft store, art supply store, you really want it to be very clean. If you put your glass, if you put your paint down on a dirty surface like this one, um, it's going to pick up hair. Your brush is going to pick up hair. The paint's going to pick up hair. It's going to smear your lines. It's going to drive you crazy. You're going to have an awful time. You want a clean uh, pane of glass. If you have grease on it, your paint will not bind to the glass at all. This was really frustrating for me in the early stages um, of learning this technique. I would wonder why my paint would constantly be moving around on the, on the glass even after it had dried for 24 hours. And it's because I didn't clean it well enough with a degreaser before I, um, before I laid down the detail work. So wash it with soap and wash it with hot water, let it dry. When it's done drying, it's gonna have streaks and water droplets on it. So then you go in with the Windex and you really, really wash it down with a Windex and a microfiber cloth. Um, so when you spray the back with the spray paint, is it a clear acrylic spray paint that you're spraying or to see it is, uh, I, I don't use that. Um, I use, usually I'll use black, like a black spray paint. Um, and I'll use as hard of an, hard of an enamel as I can get. Cause the idea behind the spray paint is it seals, uh, the paint so it can't get chipped. It can't get damaged. Um, it also uh, prevents water damage from getting in there um, and um, it prevents anything from getting scratched. I use black because black really helps the colors pop. It really saturates everything. So I'll give you an example of why I think black is really useful. So here is a very colorful piece, a very colorful painting. Um, but the background or the, the very last layer 
the, the sealed layer is black and it really helps the colors pop. It really helps the colors uh, uh, look very contrasted. So adding that last layer of black it, with a Swiss spray paint, it really seals it, but it also um, makes your colors very vibrant. All right, so you wanna start with a drawing, um, a very simple line drawing. You don't want it to be sketchy. You wanna give your um, eyes something really easy to follow. Um, and then you go in, you take your piece of glass, you put it on top of your drawing and you use your liner brush. To trace over the drawing. So you take your really fine tipped long liner brush and you just draw over it with, uh, with your black paint. So at this stage, we just have the drawing or the line painting and we have the highlights. The reason why reverse glass painting is different from um, other forms of uh, painting is because you start with the details first and you end with the background or the last, the big broad layers last. So something like this, you start with the details, you get bigger, you get bolder, larger swaths of color until you finish with the one big ground layer. Um, other forms of painting are the exact opposite. You start with the ground layer, you build up color, and then you start to slowly at the very end add the very last details. This is different because you start with the details first. Then you come in and you add uh, the color behind the line work, the color behind the highlights. So this would be the middle phase. And this is the stage where we do all the blending work. This is gonna be the stage where we do wet on wet. And here's an example of what the brush strokes kind of look like. They don't look impressive and we're not looking for impressive on this side because what we want is the product, this on this side. And then we're gonna go in with the details for the background. So the, the, the third stage is creating background. Um, and it's just, this is just, this is just mark making. This is just um, dots and curly cues. It's not anything complicated, but then your very last layer is going in with the black and it creates some nice contrast. So we'll fill in the background when we're doing the demo. All right, so in between each of these stages, we're waiting 24 hours, but I've got it all set up so we don't have to do that. We'll just jump right in and do the demo. I usually wear rings. I wouldn't recommend wearing rings while you're painting uh, on reverse glass painting because your rings are gonna scratch the surface of paint. It's gonna erase your work, which you don't want. Um, so this is the, this is sort of the line work. These are the highlights, I've already done it for you. But I wanted to give you an example of how we, how we get there. Um, what is, what's the process or how do, how do we actually get to lines that are this detailed? Um, so here is a unpainted piece of glass. And we want our liner brush. We want our Windex. We want some water. And a round brush, a liner brush. And we want our black paint. I like to scoop the paint directly out of the tube with my palette knife. And then you mix that black with a little bit of medium. So I've got the medium right here. The medium does not alter the color at all. 
the medium just makes it a little bit more fluid, a little bit easier to work with. And the palette knife just mixes it around very nicely. Just try and uh, get the kind of consistency that is useful for you, that is comfortable for you. I like something that's still a little bit stiff, but easy to um, really load my brush with. So you take your brush and pull it through. You really load it up. Um, you might want to wipe it down just a little bit so you don't have too much on there. And then you pull your brush gently across the glass like this. As you can see, the brush holds a lot of paint. At the beginning, it's very saturated. Towards the end, it's very tapered. It's pretty good for um, some, some line work that you might want to create. For example, if you're painting eyelashes, you want your eyelashes to be uh, thick at the base and you want them to be tapered at the end. So that kind of line work is nice. Um, but if you want a really consistent line, you're gonna need to just go right back over it with your saturated or with your loaded brush and saturate it. And it'll still do it towards the end, but you can see that very quickly you're able to build up your line and create something very consistent. Uh, in between loading your brush, you're probably going to want to go ahead and um, clean it because you don't want to ruin your brush. Okay, so this is how you create a line, but I wanna show you how you can maybe go in and create a little bit of detail with that line. Use one of your round brushes and um, if you want part of your line to be a little bit thinner, you can go in and sort of swipe away at it like that. Now you've got a thin part and a thick part of your line. You can go in like this. This might be handy for making waves or if you're just interested in creating um, texture with your black line. So in this way, you can go in and create a lot of variance in your line in the width of it, okay? Um, I have used before Sharpie to create the baselines and I just wanna show you what that looks like. I don't recommend it. I've done it before. Um, if you're using glass, it's not great. Uh, you get a very weak line. This is a fine tip Sharpie. The line is, is not great, it's, it's weak. If you use a thick tip Sharpie or um, something heavier, you still don't get the kind of uh, detail that you want. Your line is more opaque, but you can't create the kind of subtle um, subtleness in your line as you, can, um, as you can with the paint. So I really recommend not using Sharpie and using um, your black paint. Also the Sharpie has a tendency to lift and the Sharpie really does not do well with the, um, the Windex. It just, you know, it just comes right up. So this is how I would erase it if I did not like my Sharpie line. The paint binds a little bit more strongly to the glass than the Sharpie does. And I, I for that reason, I really, um, I really prefer using the black paint. Um, I have a question from somebody who's asking if um, you use Posca pens, P-O-S-C-A pens. I don't, um, but sometimes I will go in and use a Krylon pen if I wanna um, add uh, like a, I'll use Krylon gold or I'll use Krylon silver because they mix their paint pens with, um, with actual, uh, gold leaf and silver leaf, but I don't generally speaking, do my line work with, with pens. I think that you could, if you wanted really bold lines. Um, but I tend to like really fine lines. There's, um, with the, with the pens, like 
you, you get a lot of puddling. There's just a lot of room for mistakes and I have low toleration for mistakes when I'm working. I get really frustrated. I want things to be exact. So speaking of exact, I like to use exacto knives when I want to lift paint. Um, it creates a lot of precision. I could go in with my, with my Q-tip and my Windex to erase something, but I, uh, I think that it's not very precise. So what I'll do is, is um, especially if I, if I'm doing this for highlights, especially. So here's an example of when I did not go in with the highlights. You can see that the black line goes over the white lines. I don't think that that's very um, uh, correct looking as far as highlights go. I think that it's more correct for it, the highlight to go over the black line. Okay, so on this one, the highlights, they go through the black line on this one, they don't. I think this looks nicer. So what I like to do is I use, I use my X-Acto knife to rip up that black line. I wait until it's dry and then I just go ahead and scratch it in. It creates um, just a very clean line. You go in with a dry brush and you sweep away those leftover pieces. That's pretty important because you don't want those pieces getting mixed up with other colors. And then I'll take my liner brush and I'll go in with some white and I will add in a detail, a highlight like this. And then at this stage, if you wanna add more highlights, you can. I think that they make the painting look uh, very crisp. I use the liner for the highlights. And you can go in with little dots as well. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that to dry. Wash off my brush and show you how we get from here to here. So I have my paints already mixed. You want to generally have about three tones. You can have more than three tones if, you're work, if, if you want to add dimension, if you want to add uh, complexity, um, you're, you're gonna want at least three tones. So here we have light, medium, dark, and then an even darker color. Um, you wanna pre-mix all of your colors because you don't wanna be mixing them while you're blending you're going to be working fairly quickly and you don't want to, um, you don't want to be correcting mistakes as you're painting. One thing to note when you are mixing is you don't want your lightest tone to be too close or too similar uh, to white because then your highlights won't pop. Your highlights won't um, be very contrasted. They'll sort of blend into the background. An example where I did this, is on this daisy. You can see that I intended to make highlights um, on the tips of the daisy, but they don't really show up because the cream color of the daisy is too close in tone to the highlight. So you do want there to be um, a couple, a couple steps in tone in between your lightest color and your highlight color. Um, and then your darkest color is what you're gonna cover the whole thing up with. One thing I forgot to mention about the line work and the highlights is you do want to make sure that they are fairly thick. Uh, you wanna make sure that they are fairly opaque because when you go over them with the blending, you don't want them to be see-through so that when you're, when you're finished with this part, 
um, you see all your colors bleeding through. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you uh, what this stage looks like, the, uh, the blending. And feel free to ask questions um, if you need to while I'm doing this. So I generally begin with the lightest color and I'll go up against the line drawing. And I'll fill it in. Here's why you want to use lots of brushes. Because now I'm going to go in with a medium tone. And I'm going to bring it up next to it without bringing them together. Now I'll go and load my brush up with some more light and I'll blend the two together. This creates a nice blend on the other side of the glass panel. Then when I've blended that in the way that I like, I'll go back here with the medium tone. And then I will come in with a dark tone on the end. Load up my brush with the medium, and then I will go in and blend again. And while it doesn't look very clean, and while it doesn't look very, um, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't have a nice texture, it doesn't have nice brush work or anything from this perspective or from this angle, it will look pretty nice when when you're done. So you can see I just went out of the lines right here. I'm gonna go ahead and take some Windex and I'm just going to wipe that up. It is nice to have the Windex right there for when you make a mistake. I have a quick question from somebody. Um, sure. Can you use vinegar instead of Windex? I have never used vinegar before, so I cannot say. I'm sure you could, could Google that. I'm not, I just don't have the answer. I can't speak for vinegar, but good question. All right, so now we've got those, that blending, that blending done. I'm not gonna fill in the whole bird because I feel like you've got a pretty good understanding of, of what that looks like. Here's your wing when you're done. Um, I also have uh, a little, something a little bit uh, simpler, uh, just to give you a little bit more perspective. You start again, I'm not doing highlights here, I just have the line work. You start with, uh, see my brush has too much water on it. So you see how it's, it's loose and the color is coming apart. You don't want that with acrylic and glass. This is, um, this is a good reason to keep your brushes dry and that paper towel on hand. Okay, so here's the light color. Okay, we're gonna build a kind of moat around that light color where there is no paint. You don't have to be very precise here, but you leave this moat so that there is an area where the wet paints can be blended. So now you go in with your light color again and you blend the two together. And you can take a smaller, more detailed brush if you like, and you can go in and more gently swirl that together. If you like uh, the appearance of texture, you can even go in with a pin, like a sewing pin and you can add texture with the pin, the tip of a pin. Now for a darker shade, go in, leave that moat of glass that is bare. Really load up your brush. So you see how there's a lot of paint. And now you go in with your medium tone 
and you bring it all together. You're building a bridge between this wet area and this wet area, and you're blending it together. This is just uh, an egg for the demo purposes. It's not gonna be beautiful, but I wanted to give you a larger, less detailed example of what it will look like um, when you are blending your colors together. Because I do get questions a lot about blending acrylics. You can also paint with oils on glass and the blending there is a whole different ball game. I prefer acrylics because they dry quickly. In between these stages is 24 hours. With oils, it's much longer. Okay, so here you've got your, your blended um, egg. Okay, so that brings us to this stage when your colors are all blended, your details are all done. Now you want to make a background, uh, a background color or you wanna add details to the background. Um, adding details to the background, it's, it's not complicated. I've got an example for you here. Um, basically, you just go in with one of your detailed rounds. It depends on how much, it depends on how much detail you want. I went in here with just a fine tipped round brush, a size zero, and I added those dots and those curly cues. Um, you could also go in with your fine tip brush, uh, your fine tip liner, that's fine too. You could also go in with something bigger and create like bigger brush strokes, sloppier brush strokes. I think that that would look really cool. Um, that's just not generally speaking how I, um, how I tend to work. I tend to work with lots of details. So uh, you just go in with one of, one of your round tip brushes and you just add in little dots, whatever you want really. You can do lines. And at this stage, you can feel free to paint right over the work that you've already done because you won't see it. It creates movement, but it does not interfere with the general painting. So you can create a line that goes all the way from one side of the bird to the other. And it does not interfere with your painting at all. Now, because you do, there is a, there is gonna be a stage where we do the back, where we paint over everything. You want for your, all of these, um, all of these blended colors to, have a pretty good opacity. You want them to be pretty thick. You don't want them to be transparent. You can see with this example, it is a little transparent. Um, you can see that, especially right here under this uh, darker tone of blue, that there's a little bit of transparency right here and right here. That will be a problem for when we go ahead and do the background painting. I'll give you an example of what that looks like when you don't make it very opaque. Um, I did not do a very good job here of putting in uh, several layers of this light gray color. And so when I went over everything with this, with the saturated pink, it bled through this transparent layer of white gray that I put down. And um, I actually think that it works for this piece because it looks like a bloodshot eye but um, I don't think that in general, that's something that you are going to want. You're gonna to wanna to avoid that. So to give you an example, this one is very opaque. I went in uh, with several layers and I covered this one up a lot to make sure that it would be um, pretty good coverage, fairly, um, fairly saturated paint on that one. So then when you have this layer, you've let it sit for 24 hours you can go in and go ahead and create your background. Um, I'm just gonna paint straight from the tube on this one because this color is, um, it's just, 
it dries quickly and it's very thick and it creates a pretty satisfying background. It's got very good coverage. So I love this part of the reverse glass painting because uh, it's destructive. You get to go in and just kind of paint over everything. Um, you get to be loose with your, with your brush. You get to, you, you spent so much time adding all those details, all those layers. And now you, you get to indulge the chaotic part of your spirit a little bit and just go in and destroy it. <laughs> you just get to go in and cover it all up and it feels very risky. And it is because if you didn't put down enough layers or if your paint hasn't dried long enough, or many other ifs, if, 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 then maybe it won't come out well. Um, this is final, this stage is fairly final. If you don't like what it looks like after this, you have to start all over again. So I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I'm not going to go all the way up to the edges because I'm just trying to give you a general idea. But, you would want to go in, cover everything up, and then let it dry for 24 hours. If you're feeling very risky, you could blow dry it and give it an hour. And then go in and you really do wanna go over it all again with a second layer of your background color. It just creates really nice, vibrant colors if you do it that way. And then when you are done with putting in the background color and you've let that dry for 24 hours, then you will spray paint it black to seal it. Here's what it looks like when you are done. It really lets those colors pop. And that's a pretty opaque background. Um, I, that's why I really like these. Um, that's why I really like this Van Gogh brand of, of paint for reverse glass painting because it goes on, it goes on thick, it goes on opaque, and it creates a really nice contrast between colors. So that is what it looks like beginning to end. I want to show you what it would look like if maybe you did not build up enough color in your blending stage. I think you'll be able to see through. Let's see. Yeah, you can see through. It creates a muddy, this blue right here, which would have been like a very beautiful clear blue is now muddy because um, I didn't go in and put in enough layers right there. So instead of it being a bright, vibrant, clear blue, it's a muddy kind of blue which if you're looking, if that's something you're looking for, you can consider that a way of building up color and creating contrast. You can use that as a method for creating shadow, that's fine. But for this purpose, it's, it didn't do what I wanted it to do because I didn't go in and I didn't add enough layers. You can also see it um, poking through up here where the contrast is supposed to be highest, where the, the highlight is supposed to be brightest. Okay, um, unless people have more okay i just want to show this very last thing then um when you're going to spray paint the back of your painting and by back i mean the surface that we've been working on is the back and the reverse side is the finished product you want to protect that reversed side. This is your finished product. You don't want it to get spray paint on it at all. It would be very upsetting for you. <laughs> you would be really excited to spray paint the whole thing. And then if you pick it up and you haven't sealed the edges properly um, with tape, you're going to be very upset. But that paint has leaked through to the other side to your finished product. So you're just going to frame it like this, I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but you're gonna frame your glass with frog tape. I would use frog tape. I wouldn't use like, you could use blue painter tape, blue scotch tape, but I wouldn't, it leaks more. 
uh, it's not as reliable and I haven't gotten consistent results from it. I, I really like this frog tape. You go ahead and when you've got it all framed, you're gonna add another one right here. I'm just not doing it. You turn it over, you really use your nail to seal it along those edges. You don't want spray paint getting in there. But then when you've got it all framed and you've got it all tightly sealed, you lay it down in the cardboard box, follow the directions on your spray paint, put it however many feet away you're supposed to, and you, you coat the entire back of it with spray paint until it's black. And that's, that's that, that's how you seal it. So in one of the um, examples that you showed yes. of uh, one of your images, the black spray paint only color, only covered the portion that was painted and the rest was clear. How do you accomplish that? Lots of frog tape. <laughs> this one, right? Yeah, yeah. You just you lot you, you lose a lot of you use a lot of frog tape. Um. Also, this one's kind of a little bit cheating because this one was going to be a double sided painting. Okay, so what I mean by a double sided painting is a double sided painting doesn't really need that extra layer of sealant or spray paint as a protectorant, it doesn't, it doesn't need it because the paint part is not going to be exposed. Here is your reversed product. Here's the other one. These are the sides you painted on. What I do is I sandwich the two vulnerable parts together. So if you're, if you like to sew wrong side to wrong side, and then you seal them like this. So that there's no way that your, the, the painted surface is going to get scratched. There's no way that the vulnerable surface is going to get messed with. Um, and that piece that I just showed you with all of the clear glass surface still exposed, that was a double-sided painting. Which brings me to, you're working with glass and you're going to end up breaking something and the other side of this painting the reverse side of it, that was going to look just like it, but a slightly different image, it broke, <laughs> shattered into hundreds of pieces. So just be prepared that you're working with glass and you're gonna break something. Okay, and then so we have some, some comments and some questions. For gold leaf, is this done before executing the first paint layer? Uh, it depends, okay, so if you want to, for example, I use gold leaf on this one and you can see it on the robe. Um, it's that reflecting piece. Some people use mirror paint too, which I think is very effective. It creates a nice shine to it as well instead of using uh, gold leaf or silver leaf. This is what I use. I use a Krylon paint pen and you just shake it up and then you bleed a little bit onto your surface that you are going to be your palette and then you use your your liner brush and add in details as you as you wish i sometimes will add that in um at this stage when i have the lines put in and the highlights in sometimes i will add it there as i did with uh, the robe of that one i just showed you or sometimes I will add it in later, as you can see with it here. This is all added a little bit later. later. Um, in fact, you can see it on top. I've layered it on top of some of the black here. This painting is not sealed yet. So I've got the black here, which I added first. And then um, I used the, uh, the gold to just uh, go right out of the lines. It was just easier to create lines that way for this painting. So it, it depends on where you want the gold leaf, honestly. For larger paintings, have you used tempered glass? Do you think it would be better to use tempered glass? I think for, it depends on how large you wanna go. I've done fairly large paintings, like three feet by two feet. 
And I would use um, uh, mylar or I would use um, uh, acrylic plastic. You can buy it from Jerry's um, and you could buy it for fairly cheap. You can buy it very large. You could buy, um, you, can, you can even have your acrylic panels custom made. Um, I, would, I would not work in very large pieces with glass. It, it's gonna be really difficult and it's probably gonna break. But I mean, uh, if you're working quick and you're working with spray paint and it's, and it's not very precious and you're not doing a lot of details, it might be fun to experiment with large pieces of, of glass. And what about brushing on the black ceiling paint layer? Can you do that? Would you have to use a different type of paint or maybe even spray it into a bowl so they can use a brush for, for control, for just getting that layer where you need it? Um, I think probably what you wanna do, if you're thinking about, you don't want black all over the reverse side of your painting, um, then I would do something more like this, which you're just using acrylic paint, but you're not using spray paint here. I'm not using spray paint here, but you don't have the detail line work. So this is all like detailed and blended. Again, we have here like detailed and blended. Uh, we, this is all blended, but on the back, on the reverse side, you have, uh, very thick saturated colors. It's really, um, there's a lot of opacity. You're trying to really layer on the colors here. You could just go this way and then you could, um, and then when you've got this done, I will go in and I'll spray it. One solid coat of spray paint. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a brush for the spray paint. You're, I mean, unless, unless it's a really inexpensive brush and you're fine with throwing it away, it's probably going to stick to your brush and, uh, and you won't be able to use it a second time. I guess you could, you could spray paint it into a bowl. I've never done it. I can't recommend it. Yeah, it looks like that answers all of the questions. Great. Okay. A uh, special thanks to Emma for giving us this awesome demonstration. Uh, you got some lots of thank yous and um, uh, this was a, a wonderful thing to see. So people really seem to enjoy it. Um, and with that, uh, we want to thank you again for joining us and we'll go ahead and let Emma give you one more quick goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.